Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the Menopause Society, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Lisa Medlinski. She is the program director and genetic counselor of Family Cancer Genetics Program at Moores University of California, San Diego Cancer Center. She's also a full professor in the Department of Medicine. And if that wasn't enough, she's the interim chief division of genomics and precision medicine at the University of California in San Diego. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Delighted to be with you. So we're going to be talking today about the rationale for population genetic testing and polygenic risk. So firstly, let's just start off with how things have evolved over the past years. Genetic testing for cancer really has exploded. So walk me through some of the changes that we've seen. Sure. So I've been doing this for about 30 years now. And Back when I first started, um, genetic testing for cancer predisposition was really limited to just those very rare families that had had generations and generations of people who'd been diagnosed with cancers. Mm -hmm. um, the genetic tests were uh, really just emerging and essentially only available on a research basis. They, were, they weren't even something you could just order in a clinic. Um, then, of course, we started off with a little more widespread testing of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which most people are familiar with. They um, give women a very elevated risk of breast and ovarian cancers. Um, then eventually there was sort of this second level of, of explosion in research where we identified additional genes, genes like PALB2, CHECK2, mm -hmm. ATM, um, and the understanding that these genes uh, confer a risk of breast cancer in particular, that's really, it's not as high as the BRCA genes are. Um, but in some cases, those genes may change risk enough that it alters screening recommendations. So right. a woman may now be appropriate to do high risk breast screening, for example. And there's implications for things besides breast cancer as well. Some of these genes increase the risk of other types of cancer there can be implications for male relatives with prostate cancer. So more than just breast cancer risk. Um, so now the standard in genetic testing is not just BRCA1 and 2. It's sort of what we call a panel test. The other big change has been rather than having these tests be limited to only those families that clearly have something genetic going on, um, now the testing is a little bit more widely available. So, you know, a majority of women with a breast cancer diagnosis will be appropriate to do this genetic testing on. People with a milder family history often are, are appropriate. Um, and so that's been one of the major shifts mm -hmm. is to traditional genetic testing. Yeah. So that brings us to us in primary care where patients come in and don't necessarily have a family history that lights up you know, as alert to yeah. us as a primary care practitioner, but they're wanting to have genetic testing. So the question is, is should everybody get genetic, you know, testing for cancer risk? Is this something that should become routine screening the way we do cholesterols or blood sugars? You know, these are beginning to be the questions that we see on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. And this, I think this is where things are shifting. So there are some large studies going on right now that are exploring in closed health systems, typically to kind of assess what's the cost effectiveness of doing this testing, what are the medical outcomes that come out of doing this, you know, if we build it, do they come? Do, they, do people mm -hmm. even, you know, sign up for it um, if it's something that's offered to them? Um, and then if you give them the information, do they actually act upon it? So the studies that are happening right now are really kind of looking at all of those things rather than just launching it and saying right. we think everyone should get this test, but. But you can envision a, a situation, and I think I think we may be close, where at least for younger women, testing for the really high risk genes that are right. going to make a difference in their medical care immediately makes good sense. Not everyone knows their family history. Not everyone has detailed biological medical facts about their relatives. Um, and a lot of times we do testing and we find mutations in these genes in people who do not have any known family history of cancer. So limiting it to the people who know their family history doesn't really seem equitable either. Right. Yeah. Okay. So walk me through the difference between traditional genetic testing, which most of us are familiar with, for example, if we were going to do the BRCA gene yeah. and the notion of something called the polygenic risk score. So mm -hmm. firstly, explain what the polygenic risk score is 
and then whether or not, in fact, these newer tests are available. Yeah, so polygenic risk is, is if you think of um, traditional genetic testing as being, you know, sort of you're looking for one thing that changes medical management. Polygenic risk is kind of like tiny little genetic impacts scattered throughout our whole genome. Um, they're measured by something that are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs is yeah. the short form. And the way I describe it to patients, I kind of equate it, I call it like mother nature's poker hand. Um, mm -hmm. Because these aren't genes where any one SNP is going to change medical care. The, the relative risks of cancer for having any one of these SNPs is, you know, like 1.01. They're, they barely move the risk needle. But cumulatively, when you put the distribution of score together, so if you add hundreds or thousands of these SNPs together to make a polygenic risk score, um, you get a distribution. And the people who are on the very end of that distribution, their cancer risks may actually mimic those of people who have like a PAL-B2 or a CHECK2 type mm -hmm. of thing. So it, it can change their risk needle quite a bit. Conversely, people who are on the far end of the low, the low side of the distribution may actually have lower breast cancer risks um, than the average person in the population, which isn't really something we'd gone looking for previously. We sort of started out, well, everyone's average risk, and then we look mm -hmm. for high risk. This is a way to actually find people who may be at lower than average risk. Um, so these polygenic risk scores are not really widely available. There are one or two commercial products out there, but current guidelines are really a little cautious about it and say, you know what, we don't know the long-term outcomes of implementing this component to risk assessment in a clinical setting. Um, and so participating in a study that aims to prospectively assess how this polygenic risk score method of doing risk assessment works um, may be the actual, you know, the better way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in general, you know, studies that might be out there that women can participate in to learn more about, for example, a personalized breast cancer risk or a personalized colorectal cancer risk um, and how they can lead to recommendations for individualized screening and risk reduction. So are there studies like that that women can access? There are. So the the one in full disclosure I'm, a, I'm an investigator on is called the Wisdom Study. Um, mm -hmm. Now, this is only in the U.S., but it is available to any woman in the United States between the ages of 30 and 74. Um, and it really is aiming to look at the impact of a breast cancer risk assessment mm -hmm. um, on behaviors and on medical outcomes. So of the cancers that are eventually diagnosed within the, the context of the study, what does the staging look like? Does the personalized approach do a better job than the standard kind of very crude guidelines mm -hmm. of just average risk or increased risk? So it includes a traditional genetic test pa panel that includes the BRCA genes, PALB2, CHECK2, all of those genes. It also includes a polygenic risk score. And then it also incorporates a more traditional risk model that in, looks at breast density, prior breast biopsies, and family history. So it's putting all of that together. The other exciting thing about it, it's dynamic. So it's not like you get a risk assessment and then you stick with that. These risk factors can change over time. Right. Your family history changes, your breast density changes as you go through life. So this gets recalculated uh, every year. And your your guidance may change um, in the context of the study. So it's yeah. it's really a hyper personalized approach um, that we're looking at. Well, have to see. Not quite ready for prime time yet, though. We're going to say we're getting the data, and uh, that and that's the whole point of it is to say right. is this a, is this actually a better way to do it, or you know is the original way that's that's a little more crude and generalized. You know, is that still the way to go? I have a feeling that science is going to evolve and will fall somewhere in between the two. That is almost always how it ends up, right? Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure.